All right, it's official. We are live streaming from the NBC Sports World Headquarters. No, wait. NBC Sports California World Headquarters in San Francisco. Let's just get it rolling. What do you say? Oh. Broadcasting live Live. and worldwide. Here's Brody Brazil. Don't talk yet. Don't talk yet. Here it is. Okay, welcome to Sharks Night Shift, everybody. And I don't know what to say. Following a 5-2 defeat, I'm not really in a inspired mood right now. Watching the game, going down 0-2, fighting back enough, making it a one-goal game, but not necessarily an inspiring performance tonight by the San Jose Sharks. Now, sometimes that happens, right? The course of 82 games, you're going to have clunkers like these. It's just that coming off the Seattle loss, 3-1, and now having this game, 5-2. And I keep looking at the final score because it was 3-1, then 3-2, then 4-2, and 5-2. The empty netters always add a different flavor that maybe isn't appropriate, but let's be honest. At the end of tonight's game, it kind of does feel like the Sharks were losers of at least a 4-2 game. It was the Vancouver Canucks as the better team tonight. That is also frustrating. I mean, losing to the expansion Seattle Kraken is one thing, but, you know, it's it's two-sided with Vancouver. They've now won six straight. They changed head coaches. They're on a roll. But they looked like a beatable team tonight. You know, and I and I don't say that with disrespect to them, Brock Besser specifically, uh, JT Miller with three points, two goals, uh, two assists, and a goal. But I don't think there was anything Vancouver did out there to the Sharks tonight that San Jose couldn't have overcome. Were the Sharks, I, I take it back, were the Canucks winners of this game? Yes, but maybe more so the Sharks were losers of this game. I do have a lot of different perspectives and angles to get into. I guess I'll kind of break down the game a little bit. Again, there is just not a lot to take away from this one in positive fashions for Team Teal. Uh, But I'll dive through all that. Eventually, I'll get to some questions and comments. So why don't we just start it like this? Number one. I actually thought after the first period that the Sharks may have slightly been the better team. The scoreboard said 2-1 Canucks, uh, but early first first period, you know, Sharks are getting all the chances, and then all of a sudden, they're behind. Brock Besser with a, a twisted wrister from the left dot, and then Bo Horvat scoring on the power play, the first penalty the Sharks take, and uh, Logan Couture's maybe first kneeing penalty ever. <laughs> I know it was an accident. I know it was not intentional, um, but you just, you don't see that very often, and then they capitalize, you know, with about 30 seconds left on their power play, and the Sharks are down 2 nothing. Now, in the end, you know, could you just say right there that that's the difference in the game? Lost by three, one empty netter. Yes, but there was plenty of time still for the Sharks to come back. And I, I do want to say that goal by Timo Meyer, fed by Eric Carlson. Again, those two have been great storylines lately. Um, players that last year had, you know, down seasons and wanted to make a statement this year. They, they continue to do that. Timo Meyer's 100th goal in the NHL his first goal in seven games, but more importantly, in tonight's game, now you've cut the lead in half, you're right back in it, you gain some momentum. If you were to get the next one of the second period, it's washed away every deficit that you had faced. But they don't get the next one. Brock Besser gets the next goal late in the second period, and now all of a sudden you're thinking you're running out of time. You're down by two, 20 minutes to play, and the second period was, like I said, relatively uninspiring. You know, and I think that's, that's kind of a theme for for the Sharks, at least in tonight's game. And I, I don't know, you know, last game it was that they let the they let the Kraken, I'm still getting used to saying that, they let the Kraken hang in the game too long. Tonight it was that they were down quickly and just did not seem motivated or didn't have the urgency to catch up. Uh, Jaden Hulgabox. How many times did Randy Hahn say Hulgabox tonight? How, no. See, even I said it wrong. Halbagawax. Say it right, Brazil. In fact, let me just do it here on every camera to make sure I really get it right. <laughs> Halbagawax. Halgabox. No, Halbagawax. 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 How many times do you think Jaden's had this in his life where people 
<laughs> like, wait, say your name one more time for me. Halbuga walks. Um, you know, he's had he's had a good run in the American Hockey League. And by the way, he is the eighth Sharks rookie to make their NHL debut this season. That is two more than any other team across the NHL. So the Sharks far and away have debuted more rookies this year than any club in the league. Now, the Sharks also at one point had seven players and their head coach down with COVID. So that was part of it. But I think you're also seeing, you know, this team finding qualified individuals. They want to give them chances. They put Halbegwoks, Halbegwoks on the second line tonight. And I, I, as Drew Remenda said in our postgame show, he was probably the Sharks' best player on the ice tonight. Now, didn't score, wasn't a part of any of the scoring plays, but if you're looking at chances and all over the puck, you know, start to finish, he was probably that. Uh, was it the rookie energy? Was it whatever? I don't care what it was. It was, it was noticeable. Um, and that's great for him, but he shouldn't be the only player and the main player you notice tonight. Um, just getting back to the, the the points of tonight, you know, early on, I, I just thought the Sharks dug themselves such a hole that the way they've been performing lately offensively, uh, it, it puts them in trouble. Like if you're a team that you know you can score at will and you know you can get into these back and forth games, that's fine. But lately the Sharks have not been doing that. It was a good start to their homestand. One, two of the first three, kind of a statement win there against Dallas. You're feeling good about this. And all of a sudden, you know, when the when the easy portion of seven in a row comes, now you lose to Seattle. You lose your first one to Vancouver. First of two in a row against Vancouver. Speaking of uh, two. Number two. Aiden Hill started tonight, and you know, I'm noticing this. And look, if I'm noticing this, I feel comfortable in sharing it because uh, – I'm not the brightest hockey mind, but if I can see it, uh, I'm not giving away any trade secrets here. A lot of the goals it seems like he's allowing this year are up, specifically over his shoulders. I don't know if teams are starting to shoot there more. Uh, Drew talked about it tonight on our post game show. You know, as a goalie, uh, falling back into your crease more or being bigger, coming out to stop pucks. I certainly don't want to to delve into. The fundamentals and the technicalities of what he's doing. I'm not a goalie, never played that position. You know, I can't speak to that like I want to. Um, but I, I do notice, I mean, let's just be honest about where the goals have been scored. A lot over the shoulders. Um, you know, Besser scored 12-41 into tonight's game. So not early, but it also does seem like if there's a couple trends of Aiden Hill, it's early goals allowed in a game and goals over either shoulder is where they're being scored. And I think sometimes, too, you know, rebound control, a little bit of an issue out front. But those first two things, the timing and where the goals are actually uh, passing him, where the pucks are actually, you know, getting by him, I, I think are important to take note of, and hopefully he can remedy that. Um, but again, you know, you look at Vancouver scoring, you know, four times on him, five times total tonight. Uh, the Sharks have drawn, excuse me, the Sharks have, no, I take it back. I almost said taken. The Sharks have drawn only four penalties in their last three games. Four times on the power play. That's it in the last three games. You should have single games where you're on, you know, four different power plays. I mean, that's not uncommon at all. So it to me, it kind of tells you what this team is and is not doing without the puck. Not dangerous enough, not creating. I mean, when other teams are taking penalties, it's because you're dangerous. They have no um they have no other choice sometimes than to slash you, than to trip you, than to, you know, do something to try and slow you down. Hold the stick, whatever. I, I think as much as you know the lack of scoring in the last couple of games is noticeable. I also think that the Sharks not drawing a ton of penalties is also part of that equation and also helps draw a picture of what's going on. Um, and I also think if, if we're into numbers here for, for number two, I know I'm kind of poking around at a lot of different things here, but the Sharks have more road wins right now than they do home wins. They are 8-7-1 and one on the road. No, 8-7-0 and oh on the road, 7-7-1. Seven, seven and one at SAP Center this season. And again, this was supposed to be the portion of the homestand where you gain some steam. 
Seattle, Vancouver twice. And it's turned out not to be that. So that's, you know, you, you follow up a frustrating loss last time out, then you have this game, and it makes you think, you know, what does Tuesday bring? If it's a similar result and effort, you know, that doesn't bode well for the, the Sharks, the way they've been playing. I mean, you, you're going to get an entire weekend of rest. How often does this ever happen? Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, all off. You don't play again until Tuesday, and it's these same Canucks as the next opponent. <clears throat> so I, I see a lot of comments here, stuff I can't wait to get into, and I will in just a second, but there's one more thing that I want to address. Number three. So we now have teams like the Montreal Canadiens closing their building to fans. This is a throwback directly to the 2020 season, um, or I, I, I should say, no, the 2021 season <laughs> it was supposed to start in 20, but it was this calendar year. It's, it, it's all started to blend in. I apologize. Earlier this calendar year, January of 21, when the league started up, played the 56-game season, um, to start off with no fans in most buildings across the league. And here we are, you know, Montreal's doing it. I heard that Toronto's going to have reduced capacity. I, I wouldn't be surprised if other teams follow suit. I wouldn't be surprised if the NBA follows suit. We've hit a difficult spot here of the pandemic and of teams and what to do next. And, you know, the Olympics seem very much in doubt. That's hard to even talk about now when you consider how many players are on um, their respective team's COVID lists. And for more on that, can you stand by for just a second? Let the bass drop. Okay, um, I'm going to pull this up here because I'm actually going to fade out the music first and then I'm going to pull this up uh, because it is something worth tracking. I hate that this is a thing, but it, it has to be a thing if you really want the perspective of what's going on. The COVID-19 tracker uh, monitoring all the teams across the league. Let me zoom in and make this bigger here. So uh, Arizona's got two players. Boston's got a few more, including uh, Brad Marchand. I know he was a, a recent addition. Um, and you can see the dates um, there when all these players entered the COVID protocol right next to their names. Calgary is up a creek right now. I mean, look at all those names right there. I don't think they're going to be playing for at least two weeks until they can get settled and squared away. I mean, all those players and then nine staff members in protocol. Carolina has got some main players, Sebastian Ajo, Jordan Stahl, Svechnikov. I mean, uh, look at the the abs there. And and I think, is it? I saw Kale McCarr added today and Kemper added today. I thought there were some other names too, I mean, besides Comper and Burkowski. Um I thought they were actually whoa, deeper than that. Lost my microphone there. Ooh, that was a first. Um, Detroit, couple players, Edmonton, couple players, including their head coach, Dave Tippett, saw that one the other day, uh, Florida, a couple players, Nashville, a bunch of players, New Jersey, the Islanders, the Flyers, the Kraken, the Canucks, the Capitals. And look, these are all teams that are participating against each other on every given night, sweating, spitting, all that stuff. I mean, it's, it, this is hard to contain especially when we've seen the increases, we've seen variants now, we've seen we've seen the situation change. Like I I want to be very clear about this. You know, when the NHL planned out this season, you know, all the ideas and stuff were were set uh mid to late summer and implemented early fall. And now here we are like approaching the the true winter. Uh things have changed and it it this should not come as honestly a surprise to anybody. Uh, yes, the league is nearly entirely vaccinated, but but if you're aware of what's going on in our world, you know that doesn't completely stop something like this from happening. It does make sure that you know players have very good chances of of having serious conditions or having to be hospitalized and all that's great. But you know, as we look at this, is it? really surprising ba based on the developments of the last couple of weeks is it really surprising um you know my number one thoughts are with 
players, families having to get through this. But but it's also a, a consideration of, you know, I mean, like teams like teams like Calgary that have been leading the division almost the entire way. I mean, they've got Daryl Sutter also, the head coach, same thing as the Sharks. And by the way, that situation still baffles me how the Sharks played right through it, or at least, you know, all their healthy players were able to play right through it. They didn't pause the, you know, re, re, uh, reschedule games or anything. But now a lot of these teams are having postponements. But are we almost getting to the point that the month off, the three weeks off that the league was going to take as a break, should they reshuffle their entire schedule? Should they take a break early January? Should they shut things down, get healthy, squared away, and make sure they can finish an 82-game regular season? If, they're, if they know they're not going to use the Olympics, can they use that time better as a buffer and an opportunity to reset the league and to make up whatever games they have to and to take enough of a break to calm this situation down and to evade their players from what might be you know, the first two weeks of January, at least, what might be the the next peak of something. I mean, this is how last year played out, too. And last year was a completely different situation. Vaccines, variants, I mean, this is, you can't say 2020 and 21 are identical in any fashion other than, like, we're starting to see the beginning of something. And I, and I hate to be pessimistic about all this, and I know a lot of you don't even like this conversation, but it does feel like, how things are right now is eerily similar to how things were right before the entire shutdown in March of 2020. When all of a sudden, you know, uh, media weren't allowed in locker rooms and dressing rooms and, you know, there were fan limits on, on how many people could go to a game. And, and I, I, I hate to go back to that. Uh, I do. I understand it though. And I'm, and I'm not terribly surprised by it either. So I know that was my number three, and I, I, I'm frustrated as everybody else. Uh, but I, I just I, I don't know what you do in this situation. And, and hockey's not alone. If that, I don't think it makes anybody feel any better. But this is clearly not a hockey problem alone. Basketball's got this. You know, football, to me, it's different. You're out, there's an outside element to it. Uh, I know they still are going to have and, and have had some issues. They seem to have a different approach. They also only play one game a week, so there is more wiggle room into what actually happens between that time. Um, Trying to trying to keep up this schedule through a pandemic that's not over, it's just very tough. Very very tough. Okay. Uh, On that note, and I want to get back to the game and such and everything else. uh, I'll do Q and A time here, and. And I'll dive right in here to Big Bird. These are important, important. These are important points. Very well. They're very important points. But no, I mean, and especially against Pacific Division teams that are behind you in the standings. And the Sharks, you know, if they did not get a taste of the division early on. I mean, they only played Calgary on November 9th and December seventh. That's it. And now they've played Seattle and Vancouver. Still have yet to see the Kings or Ducks or Las Vegas. Uh, but the bottom line is, or, or the Oilers, who they will see right before Christmas. But, you know, if it, it's, it's a timing thing. I hate to say it, but, you know, a loss like tonight against New Jersey. All right, it still stings, but it's the Devils and you're not in their division. Tonight, you just gave a team behind you some life while you took it away from yourself. Right, and the same thing with Seattle. So they they are very important points. Andrew saying the same thing. Oh, Andrew, I believe, and I always want to mention this. Checking in from Japan, love to see it, love to hear it. Oh, nah, don't blame those stealth jerseys. Yeah, that was discussed recently on this live stream, and I, I hate to say it too, it's the conundrum of fans. Fans love the jerseys for obvious reasons. They are sharp. I gotta say, they're sharp. They're different. They're unique. They're classy. But there is a subliminal effect of, of their win-loss result record. I don't think the Sharks have won in them this year. And going back to probably 1819, or was it 1920 when they debuted? Whatever it was, 
I don't know that their record is tremendous when they wear those sweaters. I haven't looked it up. I, I'm, I will not look it up because I don't want to further this point. I don't want to add to this conversation, but I do recognize that it exists out there. I agree, Manny. I thought this home stretch was going to be uh, their most winnable games, teams, and opponents that they should have capitalized on. Uh, Michael saying the passing was subpar. Yeah, and I think zone entries and even exits, you know, getting pucks in and getting pucks out of zones, I thought definitely part of it. <laughs> Once again, the stealth jerseys superstition. Is it stitious or very? No, is it stitious or superstitious? We'll never know. Uh, giving up too many easy goals, turnovers in their own end. They got to get a good win streak going. Uh, too inconsistent. You know, and I, I'll i say that's one thing with the exception of, you know, four in a row to start the year. And I think, did they win three in a row at another time? I think they did. I mean, look, Vancouver has now won six in a row. They've done something now at 14, 15, and two that the Sharks have not done at 15, 14, and one. They've not won six in a row or even close to it, really. So... Tony saying that Van is really lifted by Bruce Boudreau, who is waiting for an opportunity in podcast limbo. <laughs> Van Snipers, Red Hills flopping and high corner weakness. How a bee walks. Oh, is a cool run. <laughs> Halbaga walks. Halbaga walks. I'm going to keep practicing saying that until, I, until it feels natural off the tongue. Uh, Caker Girl. Love the uh, love the regular con contributions there. Uh, hopefully, Timo's goal will get his goal streak going. He, he had not scored in seven. And congratulations to Timo, by the way. 100 NHL goals. Um, Halbagawax was about the only guy who showed up tonight. And yeah, I mean, I just feel like good for him. I mean, you got... Your, your rookie game out of the way. You, you were on the second line. You played well. You had a good game. Didn't capitalize, but the coaches saw you. Um, but you don't want it to be that way. For your team's perspective, you didn't want to be the one who necessarily stood out in this one. Halbegawax is a tough name to repeat. Oh, trust me, I know. Sounds German. <laughs> you were shocked to find out he's from Canada. <laughs> you can't help but say it with a German accent. Yeah, and Matthew, I think the biggest point is to have a quick memory about this game, but to also but to also not have a quick memory. You have apparently, if you're the Sharks, you've just played two of your most frustrating games of the season. Lost to Seattle, lost to Vancouver. You're going to get some time to let this sink in, soak in over the weekend. I hope they come out. I hope they come out on uh, Tuesday pissed off, honestly. And I, you know, uh, not only win the game, but win the game with some flair, win the game with some statement against Vancouver. I, I think in the same way that they went down 0-2 tonight and then scored the next one, like right after, they answered the bell. Uh, you got to answer the bell right now or on Tuesday. Tips Fedora sadly again. Good evening, Maddie. <laughs> yeah, that is uh, that is still a mood. Uh, Caker Girl has noticed that Hill always gives up goals and basically no one's in front of him. And most of the time, it's right over his glove. I just feel like shoulders, right? Uh, glove side, blocker side, they're shooting high on Aiden Hill. Still early in the season? I agree. I mean, you're you're now 30 games in. We're 30 games into this year, so not quite at the halfway point. But, you know, in the next 10 games, with more division opponents and with all this time at home, you, it's fair to judge them. It's fair to say what's possible. Will they you know, contend for the playoffs? Would it be a surprise if they did? Would it be a disappointment if they didn't? So I'm not ready to make that, that you know, proclamation yet. But I think that at the 40-game mark is where, you, where you, you, know, you really know. So they've got, you know, they've got 10 games here. I don't know. Maybe they come out and surprise us and win 7 out of 10, 8 out of, eight out of 10. We'll see. Uh, off topic, says Matthew, do you see pausing the season more games after christmas or january not at all the COVID is hitting hard uh, now the rams might forfeit this weekend game uh, or next week so I, and I know you commented before i kind of went on that rant uh, honestly i you know they the, the league is lucky this year that they have the olympic break built in the problem is when it comes it may be too late but is there flexibility with three weeks off 
to buy yourself time, to let this reset, to, to get it out of your, to almost just to get healthy, get it out of their system, uh, to, and it, it's got to be done, you know, to advance some protocols that they have to kind of go back to some things of last year. I got to tell you, you know, all I know from players last season was that there were some miserable times um, as hockey players, but more importantly, as human beings. You know, there were some times last year that they, they had it rough, couldn't hang out with their teammates on the road, couldn't be around each other, having, you know, Zoom meetings to talk about strategy. It's it just, it was hard. And I don't want to, I don't want them to mentally and physically have to go through that. But at the same respect, if we want this to happen and you want to make sure it happens, you got to do a few things. You can't do nothing and expect that this is going to take care of itself or it's going to be different. Um, let's see what else we got here. Used to be no one like going into the tank. Where is the home ice pride? Well, and, and you know, Big Bird, I, I think what's, what's probably evident here is this was the seven-game homestand, longest homestand of the season. This was a chance to establish home ice this year. And they didn't do. They have not done that. Even if they win these last two, it's going to feel like, okay, you won four out of seven. You know, it's okay. To me, winning five of seven was, okay, you know, I can I can sink my teeth into that. Six or, you know, six out of seven, great. But, you know, it, it has now, they, they're going to have to win both of these last two games to have it feel like a good homestand. And, and one of them is against Edmonton. You know that's not going to be easy either. And you know what else? Let me uh, let me pull this up here. Let me go, let me go back to. I know you guys probably don't like elevator music, so let me let me give you something else. One second here. Oh, I screw I screwed that up. Hang on a second. Come on, Brazil. I feel like I'm in the, like the 1960s or something. Like literally, this this is the NHL's media site for me right now. Come on, come on. I'm doing a live stream here, NHL media site. I don't have all day. Uh, let's. Oh, I was right there. Let's go to the standings. Let's go to the divisional standings of the Pacific. And uh, hang on a second. Let me let me fade my music out. Okay, we're back. Um, Pacific Division standings. It's amazing that Anaheim has rose to the top. The Zegris effect. And Terry and Milano. I mean, they have a good trio there. Uh, not to mention, you know, Cam Fowler and uh, Ricard Raquel still on the team. And, um, oh, Ryan Getzloff. Who could have forgot Getze? Uh, so, look, they're, they're a team that all of a sudden, you know, in their last, uh, what are they in their last 10? Only 6-2-2. Two, and two. They've won two in a row. Um, but... Three points ahead of Calgary. Now, this is going to be interesting to monitor with all that COVID and probably two full weeks off. We're, I mean, they're they're going to dip in the standings because of the points thing, but then they're going to have a ton of games to have to make up. That's going to be crazy. But, you know, it's both teams at the top right now, which kind of surprised me. Las Vegas has emerged. No surprise there. Um, Oilers are still right in it, you know, based on their team, who they have. Not surprised there. But look, I mean, look at the Sharks right now. And those are the last two teams that you just played and lost to behind you in the standings. So, you know, of the California teams, and I actually predicted that this year, you know, one of them might sneak in. One of them might find a way. They're all on the up and up. But Anaheim clearly right now has the best advantage going. And, you know, uh, Todd McClellan in Los Angeles is not going to let them go easy, too. They're, They're definitely building down there as well, too. So... Um, it kind of kind of frustrating again when you when you look at tonight and again who you lost to what these standings look like and and you have Edmonton uh, rolling into town next. All right, so let's go back to the chat. Um, <laughs> cursed jerseys. I knew it. I knew that would happen. Uh, what's up, Jacob? Go 49ers and A's. All right, I could I can uh, I'm I'm good with that. Just got some Mountain Mike's pizza. Ooh, now that is a good Thursday night. Pizza does sound good. I was craving pizza last night. 
And I'm like, no, I mean, I've started craving pizza last night. What I mean by that is you, you don't, you're, you're, for me at least, the craving for like pizza or sometimes it's uh, Mexican food or sometimes it's a pasta dish. It doesn't go away until, or actually earlier this week, it was for a Beyond Burger, but it doesn't go away until I've actually had it. And once I have it, I'm like, yep, that was worth it. <laughs> I was right. I really did want that. Um, oh, is it media site time? Yep, I was just there. I was just there. Um, Jeff Merrick had a doctor from Ontario on his show today. So is, is that the, uh, Alden, is that the 32 Thoughts podcast or was it his, a different show? Uh, the doctor did a really good job of laying out all of the concerns and issues. Well worth a listen. And I, I think, you know, as we evaluate the situation from the fan perspective, um, you know, corporate America, for example, very much people in offices and still working remotely. And here hockey players are basically doing their normal jobs. So they're, they're, they're put in a much different position, circumstance, and their risk is far greater. And that's why things like this, unfortunately, don't really surprise me. Uh, do you think it's just the increased, increasing contact that's making the NHL get hit harder with COVID or is the NBA doing something better? That's a great question. Uh, Huskins time. Uh, if that's a Kent Huskins reference, that's awesome. Um, I think the NHL, and I've always said this, I think the NHL has it the toughest among professional sports to stay healthy during a pandemic. What other sport is inside like hockey? that's literally contained in a glass or a plexiglass environment that has a bench that's way too short for all the players on and off the ice, that has constant changes, that has constant touching and spitting, and it's in a cold environment. I don't know if that, if that um, aids respiratory, respiratory diseases in, in being passed. I don't know. But it seems to me that hockey has it tougher than anything else in trying to evade this. And also more players, right? I mean, a basketball team is essentially half the size of a hockey roster. So you've got less players and you've got, you've, you've got less opportunity to have things happen and spread. I think that's a good question. I, I think, you know, we don't know the exact answer, but it was noticeable last year in the respective NBA and NHL seasons. And I, I really think those are the only two worth comparing to each other, baseball and football being outdoors, the nature of baseball, no contact, you know, required. It's just, it's a different beast. And also the timing of all this, the time of season, the time of, uh, you know, contracting things, the, the, the time of all this is, it's, it's apples, it's truly apples and oranges. Um, yep, no, and I, I get it, Bruce. Can we even reschedule games during the Olympic break? Aren't arenas already booked for those times? You know, some are for basketball. So you may end up with inopportune situations, but you know I don't even think at this point would you want to take your three weeks off in February? Would that was that when you want to do this, or do you really think the best time to you know kind of put the raincoat on would be January, put the umbrella up basically, and not get soaked by this? Uh, Tim, hopefully the Sharks can get a return for Kane, a prospect or a draft pick. Uh, and yeah, being without Kevin LeBanc and Rudy Balsers, I, you know, and LeBanc out for the long term, same thing with, with Balsers. Those are two players that, you know, when you're in scoring ruts like the team is now, you would hope they would have some answers for you. Uh, had enough no playoffs postseason. You know, Andrew, and I, I hate to repeat this, but the Sharks have never not made the playoffs three years in a row. And right now they're sitting on two in a row. And I don't want this season to be uh, history for the first time. Oh, okay, Alden. So the the interview and Jeff Merrick, tr tremendous job. I mean, his his uh, podcast co-host Elliot Friedman, two of my favorites. Uh, but Jeff Merrick has his own show, so thank you very much for uh, clarifying that. I was pretty sure he had his own had his own program. Read an article about. Co hey, Felix, how are you doing? Uh, read an article about COVID and hockey. Uh, yeah, if you could link it here, you should. Um, yeah, look, and I, and I think it, it, all of the things I want to read come from medical professionals. You know, it, it, 
we all have our opinions. We all understand things. We think we understand some things. We all don't understand some things. We all need some explanations on things. Um, so it's just my, my point in all this is that we often think of sports because it's our escape as not being reality. This is very much reality right now. Uh, was LeBanc's injury really from the hit a few games ago? Yeah, I think from the Dallas game, or was it an existing concern? You know, Maddie, in, in the NHL, you never know those answers for truth until seasons are well done and over, but um, sounds to me like it was from was from the game against the Stars. Uh, looks like the Sharks are just happy to throw the puck near the net, hoping for the Pavs-like tips for goals instead of shooting at the net. Oh, it's 5.05 in Brisbane, Australia. Adam, I will not do my Australian accent. Yes, I have one. It's it's second worst to my British accent. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, not, I'm not, not doing it. Not doing it. Hey, Andrew Peterson, the resident bro. Andrew's been chiming in since I did a podcast called The Bro Show back in the day. We've really evolved now to live streaming full HD video here on YouTube. Oh, link didn't work. Uh, definitely check that out. I'll check that link out. All right. I think, I think that's going to be it here for the old Sharks night shift. Um, yeah, I honestly didn't think I'd go this long because this game tonight did not offer, like I said, a lot of inspiration. Uh, the Sharks looked, you know, just not not put together. And there were some chances, and um, could the game have turned out differently? Like, could could some puck luck have, have worked out and they won this game even though they weren't the better team? Yeah, sure, we've seen that. But overall, they just did not look like the better team tonight. They've had trouble scoring. They have not been drawing penalties. Uh, maybe this little break here of, of essentially five days will give them the reset and the refresh that they needed. You know, I forgot to play... I forgot to play this theme song at the very beginning of the broadcast. I usually do that. I said I was going to play my my new intro, and then this one right after it. I totally forgot. I was all over the place. <laughs> I, I like this comment. i got to put it up here before I leave. Bruce Boudreaux is the original bro. What's up with all the bees tonight? You had Brock Besser with two goals. He was on hat trick alert. Yeah, Bruce Boudreaux has now won six games in a row as the new head coach. Brent Burns played on the ice. And Brody Brazil was host of Sharks pre- and post-game live. It was great to have Drew Amenda back with us for just this one night in this circumstance. He's in Canada, but he'll be back with the Sharks. We're expecting January 1st. All right, thanks so much, everybody, for watching tonight. Thumbs up on this video if you would. I really appreciate that. that will help other people here on YouTube see it. And uh, if you're not subscribing to the channel, now is the perfect opportunity. Uh, that helps me big time. A lot of Sharks videos, Oakland A's videos, general life videos. And uh, hopefully, if Santa's good to me, uh, some more Xbox videos. <laughs> if I get that old Series S, we can play NHL 2022 and MLB. What is it? The show? Is that what it's called? Or is it? And FIFA. So, okay. I've gone way too long. Have a good night, everybody. I'll talk to you soon.